Hey everyone. Welcome. As you come in, I'd love to meet you all. Can you say hi in the chat and where you're joining from? I'm sorry I said eight o'clock. <laughs> oh, thank you. My financial adulting sweatshirt. It's ethically made too. We have Canada, Chicago, New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey as well. Austin, San Fran, Brooklyn, San Fran, Manson, or North Shore of Lake Chelan. Am I saying that right? DC, Virginia, Bay Area, San Fran, Boston, Bronx, Jersey City. Amazing. I'm joining from Hoboken. Another Brooklyn. Awesome. So I want to make this really interactive tonight. I saw there were some great questions that came through and I'll probably address some of them just happened to in the presentation or in the talk today, but there will be time at the end for Q&A and I'll be polling you all. And so definitely be in the chat sharing. Um, I always love to make it interactive. Money <laughs> is not always the most fun to talk about. So um, as fun as we can make it, I think is great. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Everyone is joining. I'll give everyone a minute, um, but then we're going to kick off because we have a lot to talk about. Now I'm going to share my screen with you. So because I have the presentation and um, I won't always be looking at the chat, put things in there, talk to each other, and then I'll come back and check it. Um, and then if you have questions, you can put them in there and I'll address them as I see them. But at the end, when we do Q&A, put them in there again, just in case I missed any of them as we're going. All right, so we are going to talk about today how to make 2022 the year of financial adulting. And we'll talk about what that even means. But first, I wanna give a quick shout out to our amazing host this evening. Ladies Get Paid. I am a longtime fan of Ladies Get Paid and Claire and Ashley and the entire team. Ladies Get Paid is a platform, book, and global community that helps women level up professionally and financially. So we are going to do the financial side of this leveling up today. What we are going to cover. So I'm going to say hi, a bit about me, talk about what a financial adult is and why it's important. We'll talk about how to become your own financial coach. I'm curious if you all know how on Zoom, you might all be Zoom pros by now, but if you raise your hand, if you know what a money coach or financial coach is, or you've heard of them, and you can do it in the screen too. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about seeing some hands raised. We'll talk about how we can be our own financial coach and how that helps us move towards our financial goals more quickly. We'll talk about some systems and habits to maintain our progress all year round because we tend to, myself included, kick off the year with lofty goals and intentions. And we wanna keep that moving um, through the entirety of 2022. And of course I'm covering actionable steps. I think personal finance is all about action. And we'll, I'll give you some steps you can take to be financially confident and savvy in 2022. Um, and then, the Q&A. So a bit about me, this is my pooch Simi. She's usually with me in here, um, but not today. I studied finance at Wharton. I worked as an investment banker and then in corporate finance, which sounds like that means I know a lot about personal finance, but actually I knew nothing about my own money, um, despite that background. And I took a pay cut when I switched jobs to have a better lifestyle and to do something I was more interested in. And I was bleeding money, had no idea how to manage my money. And so I really started the fiscal femme because I needed it myself. And when I went to go figure it out, because <laughs> despite studying finance, working in finance, I didn't know about any of this. I, and this was back in 2011, 2010, so many of the resources were written by old white men. And I felt like a lot of them were daunting and trying to keep me out of the club. Like they didn't really want me to understand. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to share 
what I'm, it was actually terrifying to me, um, but I was working with a coach at the time and she encouraged me to break through my fear and share what I was learning on a blog that I named the Fiscal Femme. And so it kind of grew from there. As I was sharing, people started asking me for help. Other websites asked me to write for them and it, um, it grew into what it is today. And so some things about me and what I believe, I think we can do personal finance very differently. I think it can be a no judgment zone, a no shame zone. I think money is just about doing and having everything that we want. It's not about just seeing stacks of money, although that can be motivating and fun too. Um, and it's not about restriction and not doing anything fun. We can live big, amazing, meaningful lives now and save for our future. And personal finance is personal. So those are some of the things. Um, the Fiscal Femme has grown to a community over 200,000 financial feminists. You can find us on Instagram. We also have a Slack community, but I'll tell you more um, about that later. And my new book, Financial Adulting, is coming out February 23rd. So you'll be able to you see a little bit of the cover in that picture there, but I also want to tell you more about that because I'm very excited about it. All right, so what is a financial adult? Um, I'd love to see in the chat, there's no wrong answers, but curious what you think makes someone a financial adult? What type of things are financial adults doing? Now pull up the chat. Investing and budgeting, yes. Financial intimacy with partners, yes. Big, big deal, relationships and money. Saving, being responsible, saving, investing, personal budgeting, saving, not spending more than they make, thinking about retirement, spending and saving on the things that are important to them, making decisions and following through, future thinking, planning. Yes, balancing spending and saving. Someone who has confronted their shame around money. That is beautiful. Build an emergency fund. Amazing, yes. So <laughs> there's good news and bad news in the way that I view financial adulting. I saw another one facing the relationship with money and taking active role in making a plan, living within your means and intentional about how they spend. Amazing, yes. I, I agree with all of these, that these are actions that financial adults take. And I think there can be a misconception of what a financial adult is, that it is um, that it means like, you're never gonna make a mistake or you know everything about money or you have it all together. And unfortunately, but it's also kind of fortunate, it is a lifelong journey. I still make mistakes. I, I interviewed 35 experts for the book and I learned a ton and I knew, learned things that I had no idea about. So I think it's just a lifelong journey. We'll always be doing it and learning and growing. But what a financial adult is to me is somebody who takes small, consistent steps that add up to big results. It's not about making like huge leaps and bounds or not making mistakes. Um, and, I'll, and that's why today we're going to talk about examples of five of those steps, because I think that is the key. And the cool part about taking small steps is that it's actually a lot less hard than leaps and bounds. And we're more likely to stick with it because it's, we all have a lot going on, busy lives, things that you are more passionate about than dealing with your finances. So we want to spend time with it, but we don't need to spend more time than we need to. This one, I think, came up a lot in the chat. A financial adult understands what's happening with their money. And that means what's coming in, what's going out, what's going to our goals, what's going to savings. Um, and it sounds, it sounds simple, but it's actually like very profound and not as common as you might think. And the the reason this is so important and so beautiful is when we know what's happening with our money in the complete picture, we can know what's happening with our goals. Otherwise, it's kind of all ambiguous. A financial adult feels confident in their plans. And financial plans are what needs to happen to reach our financial goals. And financial goals are really just what we want. We'll talk about goals in a little bit. So if we feel confident in our plans, we feel confident knowing we get to have and experience what we want in life, which is, like I mentioned, the full point of having money anyway. So um, that's the motivation, our plans, or what we get from our plans.
And then this one, a financial adult understands the critical context of equity and personal finance. And so this one is really important. I There's a chapter in my book called Equity and Personal Finance. And I think it's a missing part of a lot of personal finance conversations that there's a history and, and policy of and current discrimination that creates the racial and gender wealth gaps and earning gaps. And financial adults recognize our own privilege where we have it. And we use that to help close those gaps. And then we also realize that we might be starting at disadvantages due to those, due to these, these equity um, disadvantages and historic and systemic oppression. And that helps us have some compassion for ourselves and realize that we're not starting at the same place as everybody else. And because this is a lifelong journey, our privilege and what we have to use to help close those gaps can change over time. So we just wanna be aware of those as financial adults. So what are the racial and gender wealth gaps? This is, it's a little small for me, hopefully it's a big for you. Um, this is the average, so the racial wealth gap in the US is across incomes and education levels and white people or white families on average have eight times the wealth as black families. And I think math in my head, seven times the wealth of Hispanic families. And then other is a diverse group, but still white families have more than the, the families categorized as other. Um, there's also a gender wealth gap. So on average, women have 32 cents um, for every dollar that a man has but this is compounded when a woman is a black woman or Hispanic woman. So that goes to two cents or one cent. Um, and this is intersectionality. That is a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. And so women of color, LGBTQ plus women, peoples, people with disabilities, mothers, they experience these wealth gaps in a compounding way. So I just wanna show you this to see these gaps have to be part of the conversation because we're not starting from the same place in our financial lives or experiencing money in the same way. I know I saw someone mention in the chat, curious why Asian groups were not included in the data. So it came from the Federal Reserve. I actually reached out to them to get the breakdown of other, um, but they did not have that data. They said it was not, reliable. Um, so API, the API community is included in the other. Um, and I do in the book, I have charts showing breakdown. I think it's in earnings in the API community because there's so many different groups within and communities within and the, the gaps are vastly different throughout. So I think that we need so much more data on this intersected or segregated and in, in dissected by different factors, I think would be really helpful to see and interesting to see. All right, so we, I asked you if you had heard of money coaches before, um, but money coaches are really like any other type of coach. They, a money coach specifically is to help you reach your money goals. And so we can be that for ourselves. And it just kind of reframes how we support ourselves around money. So a money coach is a cheerleader for us and a motivator. And talking about goals or pointing out our progress or knowing why we're doing something is a, a really big motivator. But also the language we use around our success and around money is can be much more cheerleading than it currently is. Money coaches are, or should be, I put should be because maybe not all are, should be kind and non-judgmental and create a no shame zone. And I know that this is difficult to do for ourselves, but as much as we can, if we can notice things and it's okay to get upset about them at first. And, but as much as we can try not to punish ourselves and, and look at things and say, oh, interesting. What can I do next time to make that better? And that kind of blends in with this point to Money coaches help us learn from our mistakes so that we can improve for next time instead of, you know, throwing in the towel as soon as we make a mistake. I, mean, I, think, I think perhaps there is a longer conversation, maybe not tonight, but like mm -hmm. where we do ask people to sort of be a little. Oh. 
All right, continue. Um, so they also provide accountability. And this, you know, whenever, when I, I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one coaching right now, but when I was, people would do their homework right before we hopped on the phone because they knew they had to talk to me. And so whether that is through having time set in the calendar, having a money buddy, having a community like this community, um, the ladies get paid community. I know that, that the Slack group's really active, but having some accountability from each other or creating that accountability for ourselves. Okay, so who is ready to be their own money coach before we hop into the steps? Yay, all right, amazing. Um, so I'm going to give you some financial steps you can take. Yay, everybody's ready. Um, and I, as we go through the steps, and the reason, you know, following along what a financial adult is, small, consist small consistent actions are critical to being a financial adult. Um, so these will be part of your action plan as your new job of being your own money coach. And you can incorporate all these pieces. So as I go through, I just think about which step is the first step that you want to take. It can be one of the steps that I mentioned. It could be something that comes up for you as we go through, but I'm going to have you commit to taking one step at the end of the class. So be thinking about that as we go through. And if any sound interesting, but they're too big or daunting, we can always break them down further. And if you're not sure how to do that, I can help you also in the Q&A. All right. Oh, and a financial coach also creates a plan of action for you, which we're going to do through our steps. So I thought a really great place to start um, with the steps is knowing our goals, because this is the point of doing anything. This is our why or our motivation. So I, this step, some ideas here are to take a few minutes to write down just the things you want to achieve financially. And I think some of the things you, you might've listed in what makes someone a financial adult, some might be personal to you, um, but it's helpful to just set a timer and sit down and just kind of write it all out, just get it all out there. And some of them might be related to each other too, as you go through and do it. These things can be tangible, like building the rainy day fund, paying off my credit card, investing eight or X dollars per month, or they can also be more feeling space. Like I want to feel secure. I want to feel in charge of my money and we can work backwards from there. Like, what would that mean to feel secure? What would you need to have saved or what would you need to be investing or what debt would you have to have paid off to have that feeling of security? So we can work backwards from a feeling, which can sometimes feel more motivating or powerful. And then once we have that list, I recommend choosing two to five goals to prioritize, um, which in like in the short term. And the reason is if we're prioritizing 10 different goals, we're going to make very little progress on each one and it can feel really unmotivating, but it's also hard, especially when there's big goals like retirement. So we're, many of us will always be saving for retirement till we retire. And that's a long time to only choose one goal can feel like we're missing out on other things we wanna be saving for. So I find that sweet spot is two to five goals. Um, and then from there, when we're prioritizing, it's kind of like ranking what is the most important. So I'm curious if you all would be open to sharing some of your goals in the chat. You do not have to share specific numbers, just generally, what are you working towards? Or if you achieved something in 2022 financially, what would you wanna, what would you wanna achieve? Someone say pay down credit card debt, amazing, eliminate debt, increase savings, increase investments, paying off student loans, credit cards, investing, buying a property, a down payment, paying off a business loan, owe less, max out IRA, hitting a savings number every month for a home down payment, paying off credit cards and investing and ramping up investing in savings have a three month emergency fund and save me to buy a property, increase travel budget and feel good, pay off law school loans, credit card debt. I understand, uh, pay off debt and begin investing. One day buying a house, going back to co contributing 15% of my income to my 401k. Amazing. So I, yeah, I see a lot of paying down debt, a lot of saving, a lot of rainy day funds, a lot of investing, buying a home. 
And I also did see some emotions in there to feel good. There was the uh associated with the credit card debt. That could be something that goes away. Amazing. Thank you all for sharing. And I think something to think about with goals and, you know, there's each of these steps has a whole chapter of the book. So there's so much I, I want to share about it, but with goals, you want them to be specific. They don't have to be when you start making this list or with what you're sharing here, but the more specific we can get about them, the, the more we can track our progress and know that we achieve them because we have a little sneaky thing. I do this where I, I set out a goal and then I, as I get closer to it, I almost didn't, I don't remember where I started. And then the goal doesn't feel as exciting or it, I don't feel like I'm making as much progress as I am. So it's important to have it be clear and then to really track that progress so you can celebrate yourself along the way. Um, another part of goals, and this was part of some of the questions I saw in the Q&A, we'll talk about a little bit about it in the investing, there's a step on investing, but a big part of our goals is knowing how much. So when we're saying, save up for a home or save up for retirement. How much do I need to do that? How much do I need to retire? How much do I need to start a family or a business or travel for six months? Um, so that I know is a big question and it's very personal. It's broken down in chapter three of my book. Um, but once we, that's a really key part is knowing that number. And from there we can make a plan and break that goal down backwards by looking at, okay, if I need to achieve it by this point and for investing, it gets a little trickier because money is growing, which is great uh, each and every year and compounding. So we can use calculators for that. So when we talk about investing, we'll talk more about the more trickier things. Okay, the B word, budgeting. Um, so budgets, you know, they're, they're do, I'm not gonna lie, they take work. They're a little, they're probably one of the more tedious steps. Um, I think they get such a bad rap. They feel like they're restricting or going to limit our fun. Um, but really what a budget is, I've renamed them happiness allocations because I think that's a much more fitting word. It's how we plan to allocate our money in the way that will make us the happiest in both the short and long term. And the long term is important because if we just budgeted for the short term, our budgets might look very different, but we have goals that will make us happy in the long term that we want to prioritize too. And the reason that budgets are so critical and actually this huge gift to ourselves is they give us clarity, peace of mind and allow for guilt-free spending. Because if I don't know that my earnings minus my expenses leaves me enough money for my goals, then every expense that's not an, a, an, like a need can feel guilty because I don't know if that I can actually do it and still meet my goals. But if I know, okay, I can build that in and I'm still saving as much for my goals as I want. I can feel good about splurging on things and building those things in and you can get really clear on trade-offs and things. So I think that instead of this reframe to this gift to ourselves and allowing us to splurge and, and build things in for ourselves is allows budgets to get a much needed rebrand. Um, and the first step to budgeting, and I think it's something that most, I would say most of us kind of easily get away from is knowing where our money is going. What are we actually spending? And there's a lot of reasons why we don't know what we're spending, but it's generally the case. It's, it's a lot to keep track of and everything is so digital. So step here, I think if you're just like, I need to start putting together a budget, you could keep a money journal, which is where you write down or type out everything that you spend or whatever you remember to do whenever you remember. Um, and it can be such an eye-opening exercise and I highly recommend it. If it sounds horrible to you, it probably means that it would be a really good thing to try. Um, another thing you could do to start, take a step towards creating the budget is just to record one month's worth of expenses. And you could do that in an Excel spreadsheet, in an app, on a piece of paper, but just look at if we're in, we're in, um, mid early January now, maybe do it for December or next month, do it for January. That can be really a really valuable exercise. If that seems really daunting, you can also just zone in on one spending category to get started. So if you're like, 
I'm a little bit worried about my dining out, or I'm a little bit worried about my shopping, or I'm a little worried, whatever category you're like a little bit unclear of, and you think would be really helpful to know about, I would start with that one category to look at. And then another thing that's so important when we talk about budgeting. So when we look at our budgets, we want to align our spending with our values as, as much as we can, right? We have some things that are probably not going to bring us joy, like our and maybe they do, but some things might not and might just feel like, okay, that's a bill that I have to pay for, which is a, a reframe for another day. But um, then there's also every time we're spending our money, not only are we spending it on things that could be important to us or not, but we're also supporting companies with values that may align with us or companies that have values that don't align with us. And so there's, um, this is actually for those who end up pre-ordering my book, there, we're going to do a workshop in March called become a consumer activist. And what we do is we come up with your criteria for how you're going to evaluate what you spend money on because companies are large and complicated and lots of things are wrong with them. So if we have too many criteria, there's just nothing left to spend money on. And the same with investing. If we, if we, um, well, I'm losing the word, but when you scan for all of these different things, there might not be anything left. So we wanna start with what's important to us. If the environment is most important to us, we can choose companies that are sustainable or making changes to be more sustainable or are lowering their um, emissions, for example. If diversity is really important to us, we can invest in companies or buy things from companies that have diversity in their management team or on their, on their board um, who value equity. Um, so there are different things that we can look at and a lot of companies will hopefully have both, um, but there's so many other things to scan for too, looking at their supply chain. Um, so that's something else. It's a very eye-opening exercise and it also has the side effect of having us spend less because before we're making a decision, we're thinking a lot about the company that we're spending our money with. Yes, it is like voting with your dollar, exactly. So that is, the B word, um, thinking about it this way, right? If we call it, and I think the language we use around money is really important, calling it a happiness allocation. Does that reframe how you think about budgets at all or make it more approachable to you or even like it's a little bit of a gift to yourself? Did that work at all on anyone, <laughs> for anyone? Let me know in the chat or raise your hand. Amazing, I'm seeing a dig it, that's great. Y'all can think about it. It's okay. This, maybe tomorrow will spark something. <laughs> okay. So step three is grow your money. We are getting started with investing for step three. Um, this chart right here is showing you compound interest. And I think that's like a very important part of understanding, understanding why we want to grow our money. So in this chart, someone is investing thousand dollars they started with a thousand dollars and it grew by eight percent each year so they haven't added a dollar at all over the course of this 50 years um or 30 years and i used the growth rate or the investment return rate of eight percent because over the last 30 years the s p 500 um which is often used as like the proxy for the market has had an annual return of 8.29 percent so that's that's the background of why I use that number. But after the first year, you would have $1,083. Um, and then by year 15, you have $3,302. But at year 50, you have $53,000. So you have um, actually 53,631. So 53 times what you started with. So, and that's if you have not added any more money so that it just kind of goes even higher as you add more money. So the, the idea being the more we have, the more time we have, the more chance we give our money to grow for us. Retirement is a great place to start when it comes to investing because typically it's, well, they're tax advantage accounts. So it, it, there's benefits to starting there and it's a goal. Um, to have money set aside to be able to retire. So it's a great place to start. If you have a company 401k, there's typically a, an amount of a number of options you can choose from. So that feels um, less daunting than being able to choose from anything. And um, the sooner we start with retirement, the longer we give our money to grow. 
So most of us start as investors for retirement. Um, before, and this was a question that I saw too, before prioritizing investing outside of retirement over other goals. So um, you want to check some boxes and the boxes are, you want to be using the money that you're investing for, you don't need it in the short term. So you want to have that emergency fund saved up at least some of it, right? The minimum amount of emergency fund. You want to have high interest credit card debt paid off. You want to be maxing out your 401k, matching if you have it, and investing for retirement. And just thinking about the money that you're putting towards these investments, it's not money that you want to use in the short term. Now, that does not mean that you cannot set aside some money to learn how to invest. Because what's really great is we learn by doing. So just like you might buy a ticket to a concert or some type of event, you can say, I'm putting setting aside this amount of money um, to learn how to invest. So I would say like those check boxes are really for before putting a lot of money towards investing be before other goals. Um, so the first step, I think, if you're like, I'm ready to invest and get investing outside of my retirement account is to have an account to do it. And that could be a brokerage account, which also now is in the form of apps. So there are a lot of apps out there that you can invest from where these, a brokerage account just means that you put your money in there and you can use that money to buy and sell investments. Um, some tips when choosing the brokerage account, there are a bunch of companies out there. So I'm a big fan of just setting a timer for 30 minutes to do your research or 60 minutes to do your research and then choosing one because you can spend hours and hours and months and months. And by the time you're ready, a new one has started. So um, there definitely are ones that are better than others and things to look for depending on what you are looking to invest. Um, but at the end of the day, it's better to get started than to wait until you found the absolute best perfect account. So I like to start with recommendations. Um, if you are following different personal finance educators, you can see which ones they like. Definitely look at customer reviews and hone in on what's important to you. So for example, if you are someone who loves to text for tech support or text when you need something, then you want to make sure they have text chat like available where some don't. Or if you really like to talk to a person, do they have hours where you can call customer service that align with your schedule? So not only are we looking for an account that works like with the fees, which we'll talk about, but it's also like if you like to use an app, do they have a good app? Or if you're using their desktop, website is that good. So I think reviews can help a lot with that. Um, look for a low or no minimum. I think that's really now there are plenty of accounts with lower and that just means the amount you need to start. Um, and if you have a lot of money to invest, you don't need to look for that, but most of them are now low or no minimum. So it's an easy thing to find. And then also looking for brokerage accounts that have low um, or no trading fees, at least for the type of investments that you're making. Because if you're investing over time, and let's say I'm trading every week and there's a fee associated with purchasing the investment, that really takes a chunk out of my returns right off the bat. So there are, when I started doing this 10 years ago, there really, you, you had to invest. Like if I opened a Vanguard account, the only way to not pay fees would be to buy Vanguard funds. If I had a Schwab account, I would have to buy Schwab funds. But now um, there are so many accounts that offer free trading. And um, so that's great. So you can look for that. And also make sure you're not paying any other fees because that's just taking money out of your investment return. And if you do have your consumer activism criteria, like what you look for in a company, you can also screen that against the, bro the company that you're choosing to invest your money with. Um, not the actual investment itself. We can also do that, but the company that you're using as your brokerage account. And, you know, the options are getting better and better for that. Some companies that were around for a long time are slowly changing their ways, maybe not as fast as we'd like. And then newer ones are sprouting up that have um, values that might align with yours. And then the final thing is SIPC insurance. It's kind of like, it's similar to, FDIC insurance when you have a bank account, which just means if the bank went under and you had up to 
$250,000 in the account, the government would insure that money. Um, so it doesn't ensure that you won't lose money in the market. It ensures if the company goes under that um, and can't give you your money back that they would give it to you. So most of them are that, but it's just something to, to know. And then I think there's a, a myth um, that you have to have a lot of money to start investing. And it's definitely not the case. The, there's so many, there's now fractional investing. So you can buy fractional shares, parts of shares. So you really could invest with a dollar. Um, so I think, you know, the, the world of investing has been not available for a long time to people who didn't have a lot of money. And now it's becoming more and more accessible and it's, it's, there's more and more apps and ways to get started that have low fees. And so it's been a really exciting time to be in this space. All right, so quick poll. And someone asked SIPC insurance. Yes, that is it. So it's basically insuring the investment account. And most of the ones you see, um, they should all have it. But it's just something to mention that it's important that, that they do. It's kind of like, and it's similar to the bank accounts having the FDIC insurance, that if they the company were to go under, you get your money back. Um, who is going to take a financial adulting step around investing in 2022. Just curious in this group. Amazing. I saw a lot of questions submitted about investing specifically. So I, there's a lot of people in the group about investing. I know, and I wish it's already almost 640. I, I wish I could spend so much time talking about investing with you all. Um, Two chapters of my book are dedicated to investing. So we'll talk about, I'm going to do a special pre-order thing with the prize, with the sweatshirt that I'm wearing. Um, but I really recommend reading that because it breaks down, like I've boiled down everything I think you need to know about investing into two chapters. So it's not, um, and I interviewed a lot of investing experts and there's a cool part where I share what all the investors are investing in themselves and how they're investing. And so it's kind of fun to have the, the view into what the experts are doing. Um, and how they're managing their money. All right, so step four is to have a money party. <laughs> and yes, a money party, you know, it's what I mean by a money party is creating time to dedicate to your money because what happens is we have things we want to do and we're busy and things come up and we never get to. Do, they just kind of hang over our head and stress us out. And so when we have a money party, what that means is putting time in the calendar. I have mine every month. I have a money party once a month. I recommend having about two hours to just sit down and deal with your buddy. And I'll talk about what that can look like. But I call it a party for a reason. Again, this reframe, um, make it fun. So I like to wear my pajamas and pour a beverage and put on, I have a money party playlist that is all songs that get me excited about my money. And um, that is how I get excited about my money party. I'm also, I think they become a little more addicting as you do them. Like then I think that they're really rewarding to do, but most people need to make them more fun or reward themselves for having them. So you can also say, when I do my money party, I get X, Y, and Z reward right after. Um, and it's really important. <laughs> yes, Salva's on the list. For sure. Um, it's really important to actually follow through on your rewards because we learn, we learn that we're not going to get the reward if we promise ourselves a reward and we don't do it. So it might feel silly to actually give yourself the reward, but just remember, Ashley said that I had to do it. So um, we can make the party itself fun and then we can reward ourselves for actually having the party. I also recommend setting an agenda in advance. And if you have it in like a Google calendar, you can just write it in the calendar invite. Um, some things to do at your money party that can be really valuable are running your numbers for the month. So what did I earn? I think the earning piece takes less work than the spending piece, but there is a big difference in the number that actually hits our bank account. Or if you're an entrepreneur, the number you keep after you put money aside for taxes. And so we want to account for that number because that's really what we have to allocate. 
and then what we actually spent for the month and did we put the amount towards our goals that we wanted to for the month and it's a great time to see oh that did not look good to me i did not like what that i don't like that that i spent that much in that is there something i can improve and trying to do it with um the mindset of more like a detective like huh i had no idea i spent that much on that um what can i do next month to change it and to change it slowly and realistically versus like going cold turkey and deleting the lift app, for example. Um, plan for the next month. So it's also a great time to look at what's going to happen next month and make guesstimates, educated guesstimates of what you think that your income and spending will look like. And then I, I've noticed that throughout the month, just things come up that you have to deal with. If something is urgent, like your bank account is hacked or you something you or were charged something wrong, you can always deal with it right away. But anything else can get added to this to-do list on your agenda so that you can kind of compartmentalize your money. And this works really well in relationships. If money is something that's really stressful in your relationship to put the money party on the calendar is a time where you deal with all the things. And if something comes up, we'll say, as long as it's not urgent, I'll deal with that at the money party. And this is also at your money parties where you can take your financial adulting action items. So if you're doing a weekly action, that's let's say you've committed to doing a, a financial adulting action each week, you can check in on those at your money party. So I'm curious if you've been thinking at all of ways. I um, actually, someone asked about sharing my Money Party playlist. I'm happy to do that. I have a link. It's in, I have an Apple Music version and a Spotify version. I can share both for sure. I'll send them to um, Ladies Get Paid. What are ways that you can make your Money Parties fun or reward yourself? I'm curious if you've thought of any um, as we're talking about Money Parties to share in the chat. Someone shared doing money parties has helped me find subscriptions I was paying for, but forgot about through PayPal. Yes, it is like, it is wild what people find. Like I've had a client who found huge hotel charges from a place they stayed a long time ago or random things that come up once in a while, maybe that an annual fee or something. Um, so you can like nip those and get rid of them during the money party. Any ideas to make your money party fun or how you would reward yourself for having one? Someone asked, how much time would you recommend allocating for this money party weekly? So that's a very good question because some people like to have them more frequently, like weekly money parties versus some people like to have them monthly. And so I do find that if you have them more often, you end up feeling more, um, people end up spending less because a month is a long time and you might start out with a very clear plan and things kind of get out of hand by the end. So it's a really keeps you very honest to do it weekly. If you have them more often, they're going to be shorter because you have less to cover, but you're going to be having them more often. So um, it's also something that we get faster at with time. So if um, your first money party, if you do not finish in two hours, I do recommend stopping and just scheduling more time later, because if you sit down and have like a five hour money party, you're just gonna really hate and resent money parties and say, Ashley, why did you have me do this? Um, but I do promise that over time, especially when we have an agenda and a list of our accounts, they can get a lot more um, efficient and go by more quickly. So it's hard to say, it also depends how many members of your family you have, how complicated things are. Um, but I think if it's two hours for, a month, I'd say 45 minutes to an hour if you're doing it weekly, just because it takes time to sit down and get started and all of that. Um, people are sharing, taking yourself out to eat, treating yourself to food you love but don't have often. Yes, I did a workshop once and someone shared that their favorite food is ice cream and now they're only having ice cream at their money parties so that they associate their favorite food um, you don't have to do, go that extreme, but I thought it was a clever idea. Wine, massage. That's, I love, someone said doing it while on FaceTime with someone else, like a study group. I love that idea too. So it's like accountability and fun. Um, 
having one with a friend. Yes, that's great. Ordering takeout. So I see a question about doing the whole year. So if you're starting, definitely, I think it's so important to look at our expenses for the entire year because there are things that don't happen month to month. Um, but that can be, feel really daunting to look back and try to do an entire year. So if you get on a roll and you want to do that, great, because that can help you think of things you might have forgotten for the next year. So it's a really great exercise. But if you're feeling like that's overwhelming, start with the first month. Um, and you're creating that in a way for next year by doing it each and every month. But if you do, if you get excited to do it, get on a roll, um, that's a really valuable exercise. Yes, and taxes, <laughs> definitely a year, a year end thing. Okay, our last step is around getting credit score savvy. And um, there's a lot of issues with credit scores, but they are important for us to be able to take out debt, whether that's for a credit card, a personal loan, um, a car, student loan that's private. Um, and they also affect the score that we get when we take out our debt. Um, landlords look at them, our employers, uh, I forget the exact stat, but as a, a, a large number of employers look at our credit score. So it is something that's important and it's helpful to see where we stand. Um, so a great step is just to pull your credit score if you don't know it. There are um, free places to do it, Credit Sesame and Credit Karma. You can pull your score for free. A lot of credit cards now also just will send you your score or have it available on your statement. And then myfico.com or um, Identity IQ are two services you can pay for that um, show your credit score. And they all kind of give you tips for getting it up. But when we do, I think a lot of times we think that our credit score is kind of a proxy for our financial health. And I really wouldn't go that far. It's, it's about making on-time payments. It's about how much we owe. Um, so are, there are th certain things that you can do to bring your score up, but having a, a credit score, you know, they give you the, the words like poor, fair, like that sounds bad. It doesn't feel good when you're labeled that, but it really has, you're not bad. It has nothing to do like you could have made a mistake or done something seven years ago and it's still being reflected on your score. Um, and we have so much working against us when it comes to personal finances anyway. So I would try to have some compassion for ourselves and just as we're looking at the score and remembering it's just a number and we can get it up. Um, another really great step is to check the three credit bureaus for their credit reports. So there's three credit bureaus and while they don't have credit scores, the information in these reports are what determine our scores. It's what the credit scoring models are using to put together our credit score. So um, you can do this at annualcreditreport.com. And the reason, it's actually, if you do have an error on your report, like let's say someone has um, a loan in your name, but it's not actually yours and they're not paying it, that would have your score be much lower, even though it's not something you're actually doing. So, and I think there's a statistic like 50% of credit reports are, there's an error on them. So I think it's really important to check and just see what's going on with those. And you get a free report for each bureau once per year um, that you can pull. There are two myths that I hear so much about credit scores. So I just wanna debunk them. Um, one of the myths is that when you check your credit score, it will decrease your score. You can actually check your credit score as much as you want and it will not affect your score. So go ahead and do that. I think where it comes from is when other companies look into your score, like when you're opening a credit card or getting a loan, that's a hard inquiry and that can affect your score. But you can check it as much as you want. The other very effect or expensive myth is that keeping a balance on your credit card will improve your score. And that is not true. Um, it's a very convenient myth for credit card companies because they're charging us in interest to keep that balance. So, um, and when you break down actually how your credit score is calculated, keeping a balance can actually make our score worse. Um, so just wanna debunk that myth too, because I've seen people paying interest and keeping a balance just for the sake of having their credit score increase and that is not the case. All right. Someone shared they were doing free reports weekly during COVID and maybe still. Amazing, I did not know that. So thank you for sharing that. 
All right, so I said I was going to have you choose a step to take in the next 48 hours. And the reason 48 hours is just before the motivation wanes, like sometimes you hear something and you think, you know what, I can do that, I wanna do this. And we don't want you to lose that before taking a step and having the action um, and the result that you get from that feed into this motivation. So think about which step you want to take. It could be one from my list or just something you've been meaning to do or something you thought of as I was going through. Um, and then think about, is the step small enough? And be honest with yourself because if you cannot imagine yourself going and doing it today or tomorrow, let's break that step down even further so that it doesn't feel daunting so that you can take the step and get this momentum going. And then think about, okay, by when will you take it? So if you think about your schedule for the next two days, like when is a realistic time, if any, that you could um, actually sit down and do that step? Or is it something you're doing on the go? How will you take the step? And who will hold you accountable? So is it something, there is another stat, I should come with my stats, but if we tell someone we're going to do something, there's a 65% chance that we're going to do something. If they actually check in with us, that percentage goes to 95%, which is like, I will take those odds. So if you have so, and you don't have to tell them, you know, your goal is to pay off 50,000 in credit card debt. You can just say, this is the step I'm taking. Sometimes it feels scary to share the numbers behind our goals, but just sharing the action we're taking that supports that goal is what helps hold us accountable. All right, so I would love to hear in the chat if you have ideas for the step that you want to commit to in the next 48 hours. I saw a question. So credit cards, they usually, it, they might close it if you don't use it, um, but they will notify you and it's usually a few years. Like they'll send you a, an email or something before they close it. And it, it can affect your credit score to, um, long story, but it, it affects your um, credit utilization when you close it. And potentially the average age of your accounts if it was an older account for you. All right, I'm seeing amazing steps. So create a budget tracker, money party tomorrow, amazing track my spending, money party create a budget and stick to it, money party, setting my goals, putting money in my stash account. So I think that means getting started investing, create a brokerage account within the next 48 hours, choose an investing app, research the investment funds I wanna choose, incredible, following up on a student loan, money party, having a money party. Amazing, this is awesome. Okay, so we have a bunch of incredible actions nailed down my earning income goal for the year. Amazing, that is the top part of that budget, very important step. Um, all right, someone has talked, I've heard, I don't know if it has been mentioned, I think Truebill has been mentioned a few times, Truebill fans on here. Someone asked for a raise, that is a great financial adulting step, earning more, that top half of the budget, and that sticks with us for over time, so that's great. Um, all right, so I wanna share something with you because I mentioned action items are the first part of financial adulting. So I wanted to share something with you. For those who pre-order my book, we are doing a 15 week free, other than the book purchase challenge, where you get weekly challenges or actions um, in the form of a quick video tutorial from me to take this step. Um, and you can get them via text. So we'll do a text version, you can also get them in a Slack community or um, via email. But I think it's gonna be so fun. There'll be accountability also in community, which we talked about is really important and having us follow through in the actions in a private Slack channel for the financial adulting challenge. So I think that would be really fun. Also, um, I'll tell you how to pre-order the book shortly, but when you pre-order, there's a form to fill out to get a bunch of freebies and bonuses that I'll, I'll walk you through. When you put in your name, just put on that you were put ladies get paid next to it because I'm going to do a couple raffles for really fun prizes for those who pre-order the book tonight. Um, these are my financial adulting sweatshirts. Um, I had them made. They're really cozy. They're ethically made. Um, 
They have like that super soft lining inside. I love them. So for the winners, I'll reach out to get sizes. We also have um, financial adulting, like self-care kits that have eye masks and candles. And so I will hook you all up with some um, great prizes. So just remember next to your, well, I'll tell you again when we get to that part. All right, so who is in for the challenge? I think it's gonna be really fun. <clears throat> and then I just wanna show you because the challenge is going to be amazing, but the point of pre-ordering the book is to get the book. So I just wanted to show you what I cover because this is why it was so hard for me to narrow down the steps I wanted to share with you today. I cover what's a financial adult, that equity and personal finance chapter. So the, the gaps, what needs to happen to close them. I interviewed incredible experts um, throughout the book, goals, income. So the income chapter talks about the wage gap, but it also talks about how to negotiate for that raise and the top half of the budget, our money outflows, consumer activism, that voting with your dollar, a retirement chapter all in retirement, um, becoming an investor for good is all about investing, but we also talk about ESG investing. So choosing and understanding the impact of our investments, buying a home, insurance, tax basics, and estate planning. These are insurance, tax basics, and estate planning is like high level financial adulting. Um, credit scores, then there's a chapter all about debt, and then becoming our own money coach. And what's great, it's very much like a how-to workbook. But I also have like part of it's an expose on the things wrong with our financial systems. All right. And so quickly, other bonuses you get when you pre-order. I have a 10-minute credit score guide, a negotiations guide, get paid what you deserve. The book has a checklist. So every chapter is a checklist. So you'll get that to accompany the book and a first-time home buyer's guide. Um, the financial adulting challenge I talked about, and we'll do a consumer activism workshop in March. So lots of great freebies. Um, the free guides you get right away when you, when you pre-order and sign up. So how to pre-order, and then we will jump into our Q&A. Go to financialadultingbook.com, and you can, you'll see the logos here. You can order from any of these places. If you choose Bookshop or IndieBound, you'll be ordering from independent bookstores, which is a great way to align your spending with your values. Um, and then the form, there's a link to the form. So when you put your information into the form, it's just your name, your email, so I can send you your freebies and your order number. Um, make sure next to your name to put ladies get paid so that I know that to put you in the raffle for the prizes. And then you'll also get all those other freebies I talked about. Okay, awesome. I know we only have a few minutes. I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer to answer questions. I think I saw, um, back to the last slide. Yes, I can. I'll leave that up. Yes, I cannot wait for you all to read the book. I worked so hard on it. We had 10 rounds. It was like twice as long as it was supposed to be. I had to really narrow down like, to the most important things I wanted to share. All right, so someone said, do you recommend maxing out your 401k before opening an IRA or should we do both simultaneously? And someone answered, contribute up to the match, which um, I 100% agree. After having some rainy day fund, maxing out your 401k match is like next priority to me just because it's free money in the sense that they're giving you money if you put money in your 401k. It's not free because it's part of your compensation. So if you're not using it, you're leaving that compensation on, um, on the table. Oh, also, I should have mentioned, I interviewed Claire for the book. So she is um, part of the negotiation chapter, sharing her tips. Um, and then the re one reason to open up your own IRA instead of maxing out your company 401k first is if they don't have good fund options. So um, when you have a company 401k, there's typically a, a number of funds to choose from. It could be like a few to 20, 25. And if the options are all really expensive, and that means to me that the expense ratio is high, then I would, after the match, prioritize my IRA first because then I can invest in funds that have lower fees before going back to the 401k. 
but uh, I'm seeing more and more, I think more and more 401ks have options that are low fees. And so um, in that way, it would make sense to max it out first. So it just keeps keeping things simple and not having to do a bunch of things makes it more likely we're gonna do it. Someone asked, how do you answer the question of how money coach is different from a financial advisor? Yes, there are so many different financial professional names. So a financial advisor to me is typically is someone who takes ownership of your assets, not ownership, they invest your money for you. So you open an account with them and they decide what to invest in, hopefully with your input and you like, no matter if you hire someone or not, you want to always know what's happening with your money. And you only want to work with someone who answers your questions and makes you feel included in the process and like they're willing to share. Um, you also want it to be a fee only, fee only advisor so that they're not making money when they sell you certain products. Um, whereas a money coach or a financial planner are people who um, help you make a plan and advise you and um, money coaches are different than financial planners, but they both of them do not actually invest your money for you. So they might talk with you about it. They might answer questions about it, but they're not actually the one investing your money. So I think that's the biggest difference between the financial advisor and the money coach. And usually a financial advisor is paid as a percentage of how much money you're investing. So they're a money coach would be a flat fee where an advisor is paid a percentage of your assets each year. Thank you. I see congrats in the book. Um, any advice on refinancing loans, student loans, um, or re reorganizing, prioritizing debt payoff? <clears throat> Great question. So for me, typically refinancing, how I look about at it is, especially if they're already private loans, because if you have federal loans, there are some flexibility or payment options that you are giving up by refinancing to private. So that's something to consider when you're refinancing. Also, if you don't have to pay them right now till May now. Um, but refinancing costs typically a fee. And the idea is that you have a lower interest rate going forward. Um, so a few things to think about are running the numbers. Um, how, how much are you saving by refinancing? And when does that fee pay off or break even from the amount you're saving? Is it a short-term or a long-term thing? And then another important piece I see is often when we refinance, we might be getting a much lower interest rate and pay off our debt more quickly and um, pay a lot less at interest. But sometimes the um, term of the loan is much shorter. So our monthly payments actually go up. And so in that case, it's just really important to make sure that the new payment is workable with your income and expenses so that um, you're not refinancing and then feeling really tight in your budget. Um, so that's just something to make sure of because sometimes the payments are bigger because the term is now shorter. And then as far as prioritizing debt payoff, I think about it in three ways <clears throat> or three methods. The first is the snowball method, which is paying off the smallest pieces of debt first, um, regardless of the interest rate. And the idea of that is that it feels really good to cross them off our list and to just get rid of them. And it can really build a momentum or um, our excitement around paying it down. Um, the second is the interest rate method, which is paying off the debt with the highest interest rate first. The idea behind that is that that's the debt that's costing us the most money. Um, sometimes it works out that the smallest loan or smallest credit card is also the one with the highest interest rate, or sometimes they're pretty close. And so um, we can go with one method or the other. The third method that I think is really important to consider too is, and I call it the emotional method, I made it up, but sometimes we might have a loan to a parent, um, a grandparent, a friend, a sibling, or with a bank and have had a horrible experience and we just wanna get rid of that one. Or we want, even though our parents aren't charging us interest, we really wanna pay them first. And so we can take that into account in prioritizing too, like which debt, is causing us the most emotional distress um, and pri prioritizing that. Sometimes we prioritize it or I'll work with someone and prioritize it. And then they go home and they change the priority and they come back and said, when I went to go make the payment, 
I really just wanted to pay this one. And we can think back, okay, what, what was the method that you used to reprioritize? So just, you want to under, it can change, but you want to understand why you're prioritizing something over the other. And I do recommend paying minimums on everything. So you're staying up to date, but then putting any extra payment towards that number one payment until, or that number one priority until it's paid off. Um, is it important to prioritize a Roth or traditional IRA? <clears throat> Another great question. So Roth and traditional are two tax treatments, essentially, that can be on individual 401ks, on 401ks, on IRAs, and at their, like what it actually means. So in a traditional IRA, the money goes in pre-tax, so we don't pay taxes on it. And in all retirement accounts, one of the most beautiful things is that they grow tax-free. So in our investment accounts that aren't retirement accounts, if I make, if I buy something for $50 and it goes to a thousand and I sell it, I have to pay capital gains taxes on that $950 gain. So depending on my income, that will vary from zero to 20% if, if I've held it over a year. In a retirement account, I earn that 950 and I don't pay taxes on it. But with a Roth account, when you take the money out, whenever you retire, you pay taxes. Or sorry, with the traditional, when you take the money out. So you don't pay taxes when you put it in. When you take it out, you pay taxes. With the Roth, you, you pay your taxes now and it grows the same way tax-free. And when you take the money out, you do not pay taxes. Um, a really interesting thing, it's all about what our tax rate is now versus retirement. So it's typically um, recommended if your tax rate is lower now than when you will retire, it's better to put money into a Roth. If you think your tax rate is higher now than it will be in retirement, it's better to put money in a traditional IRA. If your tax rate now is the same as it is when you retire, there's no difference in investing in a Roth or traditional IRA as far as the tax rates. So I thought that's I thought that was very interesting. Um, the other thing with the Roth, I think that's a benefit, is that we don't really know what taxes will look like when we retire. Like they might not look the same as they do now, tax rates. So um, it kind of mitigates some risk to pay taxes now because we don't know what they will look like then. So especially if retirement is far off for us. <clears throat> yes, the recording. I believe will be shared because it's being recorded and um, the slides are in the recording. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the gratitude. I'm so glad you all are here. Um, if you are, so someone mentioned the, um, the income range for Roth. So there is an income limit um, to put money in a Roth IRA. If, if your company offers a 401k that's Roth, it doesn't matter how much you earn. Um, but there's a very silly thing called a backdoor IRA or backdoor Roth. So if you are past the income limit to put money in a Roth, you still can. You just have to put it into a traditional IRA first and then roll it over. So you still could do it if you wanted to do it. <clears throat> yes, um, got another question about the pre-order. So when you, you purchase the book from any of the links by clicking one of the logos on the financialadultingbook.com, and when you go back and fill in the form to get your, your freebies, when you put in your name or honestly anywhere on the form, if I see ladies get paid, I'll know to enter that name into the raffle. Thank you all so much. This has been amazing. Um, someone asked, is there an income limit to contribute to a Roth 401k? There is not. So for only for the IRA does the Roth have the income limit. Someone asked if you already have um, a traditional account and want to open a Roth, um, what would you recommend? So you can have a, you can open up a Roth in addition to a traditional account. You'll just, when you log in, you'll see two different ones. And I think a lot of people do that um, because it, it, with planning for things like retirement, there's so many unknowns. We don't know what we'll be earning in retirement. We don't, you know, we can guess. We don't know how long we're going to live there. It's, it's a lot more of an art um, than I think many think. Um, so if you have money in a traditional account and you're like, great, that's awesome. I want to start contributing to a Roth. You can totally for free open up 
um, a new a new account. So hopefully that answers the question. <clears throat> The other thing with the Roth versus the traditional IRA, the other difference is if you put money in a traditional IRA, that goes as a tax deduction, depending on your income, it can go towards as a tax deduction for this year's taxes. So it can be very tempting too, to put money in a traditional because then you'll pay less taxes this year. Versus a Roth, um, you get that benefit of not paying taxes in the future, but nothing changes about your taxes this year. Someone asked about recommendations for brokerage accounts. So I, there's um, in part of the book, thank you so much for coming. Um, part of the book, there's a toolkit that comes with it. And so there, um, because so many things change and like I mentioned, there's new apps and new companies all the time. And I, I want the resources to be up to date. So when, when you have the book, there's a toolkit. And so with the investing chapter, there'll be a lot of um, calculators because I know someone asked like, how much, how do I calculate how much I need to retire? And there are calculators for that. Yes, you might wanna talk to someone too. That's a, like, there's reasons and to speak to someone to feel more confident, but there are calculators that can help you figure out if I wanna retire by this age, how much to put aside. Um, I also include links to like my favorite funds, my favorite ESG funds, including exercises on how to research them. But then what are my favorites? I didn't put those in the book. I put them as a link. And I did the same with the brokerage accounts. Um, so I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I highly recommend pre-ordering. You'll eventually get the toolkit. Um, but I didn't include all the apps. There's so many apps, but there are also, there's brokerage accounts where we invest on our own. <clears throat> and then there's also the robo advisors, which are, it's kind of like in between hiring a financial advisor and investing on your own. You answer some questions and then your money is managed for you for a low fee. Um, in usually most of the robo advisors are low fee index funds, which I'm a fan, and ETFs, which I'm a fan of. Um, so that, yeah, I, and then I think, you know, thinking about which companies are the more traditional type of brokerage, um, I've been a longtime fan of Vanguard. They were like one of the original low fee investment brokerage accounts. Um, Fidelity now has waived fees for trading a lot of funds. It has low fee funds, Schwab as well. Um, I love um, Publix app is really fun. There's a it's all free trading. And then there's a social media component. Um, SoFi, they're invest. Um, I interviewed Wealthfront and Elevest for the book. They're great robo advisors. Um, so those are kind of the ones that are on the top of my head, but there's a full list and why in the toolkit. So someone asked about um, weighing, buying a condo, and this will be my last question. I'm also losing my voice. Um, with buying a condo, so saving up for the house or investing um, in retirement. And so depend, I think the, the first thing is there's different levels of investing for retirement. There's like the minimum amount. There might be like, this is what I need to retire. This is what I would like to have in retirement. And maybe you prioritize investing in retirement for the need to have. Um, and then prioritizing the house after that before the nice to have retirement. The reason it's it's can feel hard to prioritize retirement because it's like the house might be more short term and feel more rewarding. Um, but there there aren't loans if we don't have enough money in retirement. Really, the only loan we can take out is a credit card or a family member supporting us. So it's really important. I think as unsexy as retirement can seem, it's like top, top priority after having the cash um, saved and high interest debt paid down. Um, as far as like investing after you've investing the money for the house versus not, I would think about it as how long you have until you wanna buy the house. So if, you're, if it's like five, seven, 10 years till you wanna buy the house, that could be money you invest um, versus if it's in the next few years, that would be money, the house money, I would recommend keeping it in cash. All right. 
Thank you all. This has been so wonderful. I really appreciate all of your questions. Um, and I, I, I don't know exactly when, but I imagine we will be getting the recording and I'll make sure I include the Money Party playlist in there um, for everyone. So thank you and like celebrate that you spent the evening talking about your finances and committing to taking steps to financial adulting. You should be proud. All right, good night, thank you.